我,我是呃，我是公民记者哈奇宝宝。我在一九八七年的时候，哎，呃、不好意思，我是公民记者哈奇宝宝。我在一九八七年的时候，曾经在啊、呃、华盛顿地区就看过他们有所谓的解救啊、呃、这个非洲雨林的这样的一个啊、呃、这样的一个呃叫做展览。可是后来呢，又看到《东京意境书》。的这样的一个宣布，但是呢，我们看到那个，嗯，那个美国他们并没有签订。那然后后来呢，我们又看到什么啊、呃？政府二度西这样的东西，那看到很多很多，呃、嗯嗯，那个啊啊、呃呃，很多事情，呃，包括啊、呃、那个呃 sea level 那个海平线的上升。那我觉得这个事情很多人都已经这样讲了。那我觉得它是一个啊，不是说我们不知道，我们不知道这个事情，我们大的家都知道。但是就好像有一个啊，后面的一个力量，后面一个不知名的力量，很可能是刚刚这位女士说的政治上的力量。那我觉得啊，这么这么大的一个问题，在啊，已经一直都在讲了。那我们能能怎么样呢？我觉得这不是一个技术性的问题，这是我的问题。哎，对，因为他刚刚呃，在我们刚讲了这么多，只有他提到政治力量，哎，政治力量。Problem, and I think this is one of the tricky things about the question of climate change. So I was trying to speak to that a little bit in the talk. That it's been framed primarily by scientists as a scientific problem, and that makes sense on a certain level because it was scientists who first identified climate change as something for us to be concerned about. I mean, if it weren't for scientific research. We wouldn't have had the IPCC in the first place because it was scientists who said we need to have a structure for communicating both to governments and among governments about this problem. So it was scientists led by Bert Bolin and others who were involved.、Um, particularly, you mentioned the need for transnational、uh, boundary, transboundary pollution controls. A lot of the work on climate change. Was motivated originally by people like Bert Bolin, who had worked on the acid rain problem in Europe, and had been involved in the European transboundary pollution treaties. So it was scientists who said we have an issue. It was scientists who predicted climate change, and of course, it's scientists who explain it because if we didn't have science, many of us might notice that the weather seems to be changing. You know, people in the, in the United States. Who live in the northeast, where my sister lives, see that trees are blossoming earlier in the springtime. They see that the maple syrup is running earlier than it used to. Something they pay very close attention to. But we wouldn't know what was causing it. We couldn't know why this was happening without science. So science is essential for understanding the causes. And because science is essential for understanding the causes, it's also Essential for understanding the solutions, because if we didn't know that greenhouse gases were the major driver, along with deforestation, then we wouldn't know that we needed to be talking about energy and fossil fuels and our energy system and the external costs of carbon. So there's a whole set of social and political issues that fall out from the scientific understanding. So the science is crucial, and we need the science to continue, but at the same time, it's not enough. It's what we might call a necessary but not sufficient condition, and I think part of the problem we have, part of the reason that we have a bit of an impasse now, 
is because we haven't actually paid enough attention to the political and social and cultural dimensions. So in my own work with Eric Conway, one of the things we were looking at was, well, there was all this terrific scientific work done by wonderful, brilliant, dedicated scientists who thought, by and large, that if they just explained the science and explained it clearly, they could sort of hand over the science to the politicians and the politicians would act on it. And that didn't happen. In fact, what happened in the United States was almost the reverse. What happened was a backlash against the science that left the scientists stunned. And in our work, we talk about this, how the scientific community really wasn't prepared to deal with the backlash, partly because they didn't anticipate it. They predicted climate change, but they did not predict climate change backlash, right? And partly because they didn't have the toolkit, because most scientists are not trained in history or politics or economics. So when they started facing a political opposition, they really didn't know how to respond to it. And most scientists' response was more science, more of what we already do, more of what we know how to do. And so they, they said, well, let's do more science. Let's prove this more clearly. Let's check out this little problem and that little problem. And you know, let's really nail the attribution issues. And let's look more closely at the troposphere. And it's not that that was a bad thing to do. And on some level, I think, I mean, scientists have to do science, right? That's what they do. But on some level, it was the wrong answer. Because if the opposition is not driven by inadequacies in the science, then it won't be fixed by better science. And I think the scientific community has begun to come to grips with that, but I think it's still very difficult. Because on some level, it means accepting that more of the attention to the solutions has to come from people working in politics, in industry, and in the social sciences. And so I think it means that physical scientists, natural scientists, have to become better partners with their colleagues in the social sciences. And it means that the research universities have to begin to prioritize the social sciences more than we have in the past. And that's a very hard thing uh, for a number of reasons, which people in this room will probably understand. The leadership of most major research universities in the United States, and I would say here in Taiwan as well, from what I've seen in the last day, is mostly scientists and engineers. And that's not a coincidence. There's a good reason for that. It's because of the huge importance of science and engineering in the world since World War II. The last 50 years have really been a kind of glory age of physical science. And that's good. I love science. <laughs> but um, we're in a slightly new historical moment. And I've seen this in my own university, where the leadership of my university for many years was almost entirely chemists. I mean, that alone was problematic enough, but <laughs> no offense. But, no, but I mean, any, any, you know, if the leadership of your institution is too much of any one thing, that's a bad sign. Um, so, so it's very difficult. And when I try to talk to some of my scientific colleagues about this issue, you know, it starts getting quite delicate if you suggest that in a finite research budget, more of the money should go to social science research because that means less has to go to something else. And nobody wants to say, yeah, you know, you're right. My field is just not as important as it used to be. And we should give more, we should give money, you know, take money away from my field and give it to some other field. Almost no one is ever willing to say that. However, so there is a response to that. And I actually had a very uh, interesting conversation years ago with Inez Fung, maybe some of you know her, Chinese scientist at Berkeley. Wonderful, wonderful person. But we were having this conversation, and she said to me, well, it makes me very nervous, you know, if I hear someone say there should be less money for climate modeling. So I said, well, don't worry, because the amount of money it takes to support me is not even the rounding error in the budget for a satellite, <laughs> right? So historians and economists and psychologists and social scientists were very, very cheap. You know, we're a very cheap date. It doesn't take a lot of money to support really excellent first-class research in history of science or social science of various kinds. And so, you know, in a way, this is a message to the university leadership that is here. I think that for, you know, it's clear that Taiwan is, you know, Taiwanese scientists have done amazing work. 
in many of these areas, and I'm very impressed by what I've seen in the last 24 hours. I think Taiwan could be a leader on some of these other dimensions as well, but it does take leadership, and it takes the willingness to say that what we've done for the last 50 years has been excellent and outstanding and important, and now there's something a little bit different that we need to do in the next 50 years, and we can do that too. And we can have the courage to do that and the leadership to do that. And we can make a difference in the world if we have that courage and willingness to do that. I didn't mean to give a pitch, but there you go. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> well, uh, I might want to say a few words on um, uh, that line. Um, here in Taiwan, in the uh, uh, place that I now work, um, the Academia Sinica, our national academy, and uh, that is very much different from the U.S. academy because we have a uh, research uh, institute, we have uh, 30 some research institutes. But the thing I want to uh, point out is that uh, uh, at Academia Sinica, we have three divisions, physical sciences, life sciences, social sciences, and humanities. And unlike some of your universities, unlike most of the universities in the world, in our academy, the three divisions are more or less unequal. And the uh, humanity and social sciences division uh, get uh, comparatively Better, is comparatively better supported than most of the university liberal arts uh, and arts and sciences uh, uh, college. And because of that, uh, we think we have a better chance to uh, uh, really start the type of research you talked about. The, interdisciplinary or even cross-cultural collaboration. And sustainability study is one of them. And uh, so we just initiated such a study, sustainability science at the academy with, with full uh, <coughs> participation of the three divisions. Uh, we also, I think you just mentioned uh, the transboundary aspect of the study of the issues. Perhaps Professor Chen can make some comments. Yeah, uh, actually I can add on some of these perspectives that um, you just mentioned on this uh, three divisions of academia Sinica. And at the special time of we are now, I personally believe the 21st century is a century of Asia. So uh, we really can provide some solution to humankind. We, as a, one of the Asian countries, uh, really know what we think and what we act. Right. So. Uh, most people believe, and uh, I think uh, the evidence show us the uh, current situation of global warming, global change, are shaped by Western civilizations that are uh, pushing us to think the kind of quality of life should be uh, energy intensive dependent, and the kind of uh, manufacturing, social development should be such and such. And we follow, uh, and we, uh, as one of the four dragons, uh, we uh, succeeded quite uh, magnificently in the past uh, 50 years. Then uh, we come to this point, what should we do? Especially under the strong influence of uh, other Asian countries, especially China, it's about 100 times uh, bigger than Taiwan in terms of productions. <laughs> way of life, you know, that's uh, put uh, us to think, should we uh, continue this kind of uh, uh, development?
from Pathway uh, sustainably. And uh, I truly don't believe it's based on the readings I have and the study I have. So it would take to us to think of another alternative ways of development. And Taiwan is really a pivotal place that uh, we have this uh, economic development experience and we also have these cultural junctures that, that can be, cannot be filled, felt or experienced by most of uh, Westerners, including Americans or Europeans. So this is um, a point that I agree that uh, social science or humanity have to be uh, stressed in this society. And until now, we still uh, engineering oriented, oriented, you know, scientists oriented from our, uh, our uh, modern values. It's not our traditional values, you know. Uh, I myself, and even I ask my kids, that if you have anything to choose, choose for science. <laughs> so that's uh, very, very natural to us, you know, bright uh, young people will go for science and uh, engineers. That, uh, but we all know this is not uh, the only way of solutions. So over the past few years, I have been uh, talking about this uh, transboundaries uh, uh, problem, air pollution problems with our colleagues in Korea, in Japan, in China, in Thailand. Malaysia and Indonesia. I uh, come, I get then the conclusion I have in the last slide. I get it that we have to have a treaties, we have to have a cooperative uh, study, we have to have a harmonized environmental st standards, and we uh, better to have a green economy. But you know, most of the scientists that. Uh, uh, give me the same feedback as we talked today, that we are a minority in the society, that the politicians and bureaucrats, uh, most of the time, uh, they uh, pay deep service to us. <laughs> they don't uh, think in the same field as we think. That's very difficult uh, barriers. And I thought uh, in Western society would be better, but later on, yeah. <laughs> In the past five, four years, I was involved in a European Union project with uh, 14 countries from 24 institutions in Europe. And we are talking about PM 2.5 standards because Europeans is trying to push very, they are trying try to push very hard to lower the PM 2.5 standards. So over the uh, discussions, I find out it's the same. <laughs> So scientists and politicians are talking or using different uh, terms. So how can we uh, force it to, to, to do that? And uh, one uh, personal note is that um, I, I happen to know the brothers of uh, Professor Leo years ago when uh, he was uh, vice premier and I, uh, I conduct a uh, grand plan for sustainability for Taiwan EPA. So I, I cooperated with professor from Harvard and uh, University of Tokyo together, and we I decided to interview three persons in Taiwan and come up a sustainable plan for Taiwan. So the first one is uh, uh, Professor Liu Zhaoxuan. The second one is. Uh, and uh, the third one is Zheng Yan. So I interviewed these three, I called them. One is a scientist in the government. One is a scientist in the academia. And one is a uh, kind of uh, leader of our civil society, the biggest Buddhist group now in Taiwan, probably in the world. And they are all talking about sus uh, sustainability. But uh, they all say this, uh, government is very difficult <laughs> to make change. So this, um, uh, but I think we, 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 we have a, a <coughs> kind of a 20 year struggle between this uh, economic de development and this um, environmental protections in Taiwan. A lot of lessons we learned, including this uh, 
risk there is acceptable risk. Probably uh, uh, we can come up with something that uh, will be useful for for humankind in the future. And uh, uh, this is a kind of a personal experience and some of my thinking of this. And I really appreciate this kind of uh, discussions. You know, it's not usual. It's very unusual for those <laughs> so many prominent professors sit together in the whole morning. Most of the time, a lot of the government officials just left. They just show up and show their face, then they left. You know, shaking hands. That's, uh, that's a way. That's a very, very different culture I, 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 I learned when I came back. How come it's important issues and they cannot stay here for for hours and for us to discuss? Sometimes even uh, the presidents of deans of our university too, they show up. <laughs> so I really appreciate this morning's uh, discussions and I think we have uh, a very good meeting in and uh, it's all because you come here and we have this. <laughs> okay, so Professor Liu, this is my comment. Thank you. Can we come back from the floor?